The Science Success Center, with funding from Title V, presents Animal Digestion, a Biology Workshop. Hi, I'm Steve. There are a variety of ways that animals ingest their food. Suspension feeders extract food particles suspended in the surrounding water. Substrate feeders live in or on their food source and eat their way out of it. Fluid feeders obtain food by sucking nutrient-rich fluids from a living host, either a plant or an animal. And lastly, bulk feeders ingest large pieces of food. Digestion in an animal is a breaking down of polymers into monomers. Figure 5 shows and explains the different polymers and their respective monomers. Proteins break down into amino acids. Carbohydrates break down into monosaccharides. Nucleic acids, which form our DNA and RNA, break down into nucleotides, and fats break down into glycerol and fatty acids. Diagram 1 illustrates an overview of the four main stages of food processing. Stage 1, which is ingestion, basically is the act of eating. Stage 2, digestion, is the breaking down of food into molecules small enough for the body to absorb. Stage 3, Absorption. The cells lining the digestive tract absorb the broken down polymers as we explained in the previous slide, which, as we said, are the amino acids, simple sugars, nucleotides, and fat monomers. Then, from the digestive tract, these nutrients travel into the blood to the body cells. Lastly, stage 4, elimination, undigested material passes out of the digestive tract. The simplest of all digestive compartments are food vacuoles within a cell. Most animals, however, use other specialized compartments to break down larger foods. A gastrovascular cavity is a digestive compartment with a single opening, which is the mouth. Diagram 2 illustrates an example of the digestion that occurs within a gastrovascular cavity. First, gland cells lining the gastrovascular cavity secrete digestive enzymes that, too, break down the soft tissues of the prey. Third, the food particles are then engulfed by the other cells. Where lastly, they are then broken down in food vacuoles. Most animals have an elementary canal, a digestive tract with two openings, a mouth and an anus. Food entering the mouth usually passes into a pharynx or throat. Depending on the species, the esophagus may channel food to a crop, gizzard, or a stomach. A crop is a pouch-like organ in which food is softened and stored. Stomachs and gizzards may also store food temporarily, but they are more muscular and they churn and grind the food. Chemical digestion and nutrient absorption occur mainly in the intestine. Undigested material are expelled through the anus. Figure 6 shows examples of three types of elementary canals. Diagram 3 gives an overview of the human digestive system. First, food enters the mouth and is chewed in the oral cavity, and then pushed by the tongue into the pharynx. Once food is swallowed, muscles propel it through the esophagus. Then, sphincters regulate the passage of food into and out of the stomach. The final steps of digestion and nutrient absorption occurs in the small intestine over a period of five to six hours. Undigested material moves slowly through the large intestine, taking approximately 12 to 24 hours. And feces are stored in the rectum and then expelled through the anus. Now we see a schematic representation of what was just explained. Try and remember the basic components of the human digestive tract, the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small and large intestines, the rectum, and lastly, the anus. Digestion begins in the oral cavity in the form of chemical and mechanical digestion. The saliva excreted by the salivary glands contains a digestive enzyme amylase which begins to break down the starch in your food. This is a chemical digestion. Mechanical digestion occurs by the chewing and smashing of food performed by the teeth. Now let's describe what happens after the food has gone past the oral cavity. Well, first off, most of the time the esophageal opening is closed off by a sphincter. This allows air to enter the larynx and flow through the trachea to the lungs. However, this situation changes when you start to swallow. The tongue pushes the bolus of food into the pharynx, triggering the swallowing reflex. Then, the esophageal sphincter relaxes and allows the bolus to enter the esophagus. 
At the same time, the larynx moves upward and tips the epiglottis down over the opening to the larynx. In this position, the epiglottis prevents food from passing into the trachea, blocking the breath hole. After the bolus enters the esophagus, the larynx moves back downward, allows the epiglottis to tip up again, and the breath passage reopens. The esophageal sphincter contracts then after above the bolus. The esophagus is a muscular tube that conveys food boluses from the pharynx to the stomach. The muscles at the very top of the esophagus are under voluntary control. Therefore, the act of swallowing begins voluntarily, but then involuntary waves of contraction by smooth muscles in the rest of the esophagus take over. Figure 8 shows how waves of muscle contractions, or as we call it, peristalsis, squeeze a bolus toward the stomach. Now the food bolus has made its way to the stomach where some chemical digestion will occur. The stomach secretes gastric juice, which is made up of mucus, enzymes, and strong acid. The pH of gastric juice is about 2. The function of the stomach is to break down food and also destroy bacteria. The gastric glands have three types of cells that secrete different components of the gastric juice. Mucus cells secrete mucus, which lubricates and protects the cells lining the stomach. Parietal cells secrete hydrogen ions and chloride ions, which combine to form hydrochloric acid. Chief cells secrete pepsinogen, an inactive form of the enzyme pepsin. The diagram on the right of the figure indicates how pepsinogen, hydrochloric acid, and pepsin interact. First, pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid are secreted into the lumen of the stomach. Next, the hydrochloric acid converts pepsinogen to pepsin. And lastly, pepsin then activates more pepsinogen, starting a chain reaction. Pepsin is important because it begins the chemical digestion of proteins. It splits polypeptides into even smaller polypeptides. This overall process primes the proteins for further digestion that will take place in the small intestine. The low pH of the stomach kills most microbes, but not the acid-tolerant Helicobacter pylori. This bacterium burrows beneath the mucus and releases harmful chemicals. The growth of this bacterium seems to result in a localized loss of protective mucus and damage to the cells lining the stomach. Numerous white blood cells move into the stomach then and fight the infection, but their presence is associated with a mild inflammation of the stomach called gastritis. Gastric ulcers develop when pepsin and hydrochloric acid destroy cells faster than the cells can regenerate. Eventually, the stomach wall may erode to the point that it actually has a hole in it. This hole can lead to a life-threatening infection with the abdomen or internal bleeding. Two large organs, the pancreas and the liver, contribute to digestion in the small intestine. The pancreas produces a pancreatic juice, a mixture of digestive enzymes, and an alkaline solution rich in bicarbonate. The bicarbonate acts as a buffer to neutralize the acidity of chyme as it enters the small intestine. The pancreas also produces hormones that regulate blood glucose levels. In addition to its many other functions, the liver produces bile. bile contains salts that emulsify fats making it easier for enzymes to catalyze. The gallbladder stores the bile until it's needed in the small intestine. The first 25 centimeters or so of the small intestine is called the duodenum. All four types of the large molecules, sugars, proteins, nucleic acids, and fats are digested in the small intestine. Table 1 summarizes the enzymes that are used. Starch is broken down by pancreatic amylase into maltose, which is a disaccharide. Then maltase, sucrase, and lactase break down the maltose into a monosaccharide. Polypeptides, which are the main components of protein, break down into smaller polypeptides first by the use of trypsin and chemotrypsin. Then the small polypeptides are further broken down into amino acids with aminopeptidase, carboxypeptidase, and dipeptidase. DNA and RNA are first broken down into nucleotides by nucleases, and then other enzymes break down the nucleotides into their three components, nitrogenous bases, sugars, and phosphate. Fats are first emulsified by bile salts, which break down the fats into small fat droplets. Then lipase breaks down the droplets into fatty acids and glycerol. Finally, the small intestine is well suited for its task of absorbing nutrients. Its lining has a huge surface area, roughly 300 meters square, about the size of a tennis court. 
Around the inner wall of the small intestine are large circular folds and numerous small finger-like projections called villi. Each of the epithelial cells lining a villus has many tiny surface projections called microvilli. The microvilli extend into the lumen of the intestine and greatly increase the surface area across which nutrients are absorbed. Some nutrients are absorbed by simple diffusion, other nutrients are pumped against concentration gradients into epithelial cells. One of the liver's many functions is processing nutrient-laden blood from the intestines. Well, what does this mean? As indicated in Figure 11, notice the capillaries on the intestines and how they converge to the hepatic portal vein, which lead to the liver. Basically, all the nutrients that were absorbed by the intestine first make their way to the liver. The liver then removes excess glucose from the blood and converts it to glycogen. Liver cells also synthesize plasma proteins important in blood clotting and in maintaining the osmotic balance of the blood, as well as lipoproteins that transport fats and cholesterol to body cells. The liver also modifies and detoxifies substances absorbed by the digestive tract before the blood carries these materials to the heart for distribution. The large intestine or colon is about 1.5 meters long and 5 centimeters in diameter. As figure 12 shows, it joins the small intestine at a T-shaped junction where a sphincter controls the passage of unabsorbed food material out of the small intestine. One arm of the T is a pouch called the cecum. The appendix, a small finger-like extension of the cecum, contains a mass of white blood cells that make a minor contribution to immunity. One of the major functions of the colon is to absorb water from the alimentary canal. As the water is absorbed, the remains of the digested food become more solid as they move along the colon by peristalsis. These waste products, the feces, consist mainly of indigestible plant fibers and prokaryotes that normally live in the colon. Some of our colon bacteria, such as E. coli, produce important vitamins including biotin, folic acid, several other B vitamins, and the vitamin K, which are then absorbed by the colon. Feces are stored in the final portion of the colon, the rectum, until they can be eliminated. Strong contractions of the colon create the urge to defecate. Two rectal sphincters, one voluntary and the other involuntary, regulate the opening of the anus. Thank you everyone for watching. Come visit us at the SSC if you have any questions. Good luck in all your studies and tune in for the next workshop.